might have to suspend the hearing briefly, but hopefully it won't be uh, for too long. Uh, and I, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission's hearing on human rights in Bahrain next steps. Um, I will introduce our witnesses in a few minutes, uh, but I would like to welcome them now, and I want to thank them for taking the time to join us today. All of them have been involved for many years in the effort to protect human rights uh, and foster democratic reform in Bahrain. And I very much appreciate their commitment and their many contributions. I want to state for the record that the Commission did invite representatives of the U.S. State Department to testify today, but we were informed that no one was available to participate. I regret the Department's absence because Bahrain is a longstanding ally whose stability and future development is of key importance to the United States. I have appreciated past engagement with State on the human rights situation in Bahrain, including a briefing I received a few weeks ago. And I have taken note of recent statements by State Department officials expressing concern over the increasing repression against human rights defenders and opposition political leaders that motivates this hearing. I know that for some, I know that for some at State, the human rights situation in Bahrain and its implications for that country's stability are of genuine concern. So it is truly unfortunate that we will not have the opportunity for a dialogue with the State Department today. This is the fourth hearing uh, the, the Human Rights Commission has held on the human rights situation in Bahrain since 2010. We have also hosted briefings. We have issued statements. We have written letters. And we have supported Bahraini prisoners of conscience, individuals who have been imprisoned for crimes such as writing op-eds sending tweets, or going to meetings. In the aftermath of the brutal repression of a citizen protest in 2011, we have, consistently, um, we have consistently encouraged the government to protect the fundamental civil and political rights of all Bahraini people and to move forward with reforms that would satisfy their democratic aspirations. Since 2011, there have been hopeful moments the King's embrace of the 26 recommendations of the Bahraini Independent Commission of Inquiry, which provided at least a partial roadmap for reform and the start of the national dialogue that led to constitutional amendments in May 2012. But during the last couple of years, reforms have clearly stalled. The national dialogue has been suspended since 2014. The State Department's most recent report on the status of the BICI recommendations makes clear that they have not been fully implemented and that, quote, national reconciliation as envisioned by the report has not yet been achieved, uh, end quote. And in recent months, we have witnessed a sharp escalation and repression against human rights defenders and opposition political leaders. Some of the things that have happened. In June, rights activists were prevented from traveling to the UN rights Council, uh, Human Rights Council uh, and have been slapped with travel bans. Last May, Sheikh Ali Salman, uh, the leader of Wafiq, the largest opposition political so uh, society in the country, who was already imprisoned after calling for political reform, had his four-year prison term extended to nine years. In July, the government dissolved Wafiq. Wafiq, Wafiq. The citizenship of Shia cleric Issa Qasim was revoked. Prompting, prompting thousands of protesters to take to the streets and protest. He is one of more than 300 people who have been stripped of their citizenship in recent years. At least four other Shia clerics have been charged with illegal gathering due to their involvement in protests. In June, an amendment was passed prohibiting people who are active in religious positions from engaging in political act activities. Well-known activist Nabil Rajab was rearrested and charged with, quote, insulting a statutory body, end quote, for tweets uh, about torture uh, in Jawa prison and, quote, disseminating false rumors in time of war, end, end of quote, for criticizing the Saudi-led war in Yemen, charges that can mean up to 13 years in prison. Then last Sunday, Nabil, Nabil wrote an op-ed for the New York Times from jail. The next day, Bahraini prosecutors ad added a charge for, quote, deliberate dissemination of false news and spreading uh, tendentious rumors that undermine the prestige of the state, end of quote. I mean, the list is longer, um, and so long that I'd be here all 
afternoon um, reading them. But I expect we're going to hear more detail about the crackdown during today's testimonies. We in the United States are not the only people worried about this pattern. In August, uh, five UN Special Rapporteurs issued a joint statement expressing their concern that Bahraini authorities were engaged in systematic harassment of the majority Shia's population. This escalation of repression worries me greatly. Bahrain is a major non-NATO ally that formally joined the U.S.-led anti-Islamic state coalition in 2014. The U.S. Naval Command headquarters in Bahrain, home to the Fifth Fleet, is the cornerstone of the security relationship. Bahrain benefits from U.S. foreign military financing, international military education and training funds, um, and the NADR anti-terrorism funding. With the exception of some restrictions on support to the Ministry of Interior, the security relationship has not been affected by Bahrain's reaction to its internal unrest. Yet it should be self-evident by now that selling arms and strengthening the military capacity of Middle Eastern allies is not a sufficient strategy to fight terrorism. Poor governance and the systematic repression of fundamental rights with their attendant loss of human dignity contribute in, a ma in major ways to the conditions that feed radicalization throughout the region. What I see in Bahrain are government actions that are deepening and hardening sectarian divides and closing off opportunities for political solutions to longstanding problems. I believe this is a grave error that will eventually undermine Bahrain's stability, leaving the U.S. in a difficult situation in yet another Middle Eastern country. Bahrain fears that Iran could meddle in its eternal affairs, but its own actions are opening the door and increasing that risk. And so today I look forward to hearing the recommendations on how the U.S. government and Congress can encourage and provide incentives for Bahrain to return to the path of serious political reform. Uh, and I hope, that, um, I hope that, uh, that some of the suggestions made here uh, will be heeded uh, uh, and uh, listened to by the administration. I also would like to formally submit all the witnesses' testimony into the hearing record. I also want to submit the record, the New York Times editorial entitled Punishing Dissent in Bahrain, which was dated September 7, 2016, uh, a press re release entitled UN Rights Experts Urge Bahrain to Cease the Persecution of Shias, dated August 16, 2016, uh, the U.S. State Department congressionally mandated report on steps uh, by the Bahraini government to implement the, the recommendations of the 2011 report of the Bahrain Independent Commission on Inquiry submitted on June 21st, 2016. And um, again, just one last word. I mean, I, uh, we have reached a critical moment here. Uh, the situation uh, in Bahrain is very, very serious. The human right, rights situation is grave. Um, and, um, and I think that uh, our government here in the United States uh, needs to do much, much more uh, than uh, has been done up to this point. Um, and with that, let me introduce our panel. Uh, Brian Dooley, who's the Director of, the Human, of, of Human Rights Defenders at Human Rights First. I'm going to give you guys abbreviated introductions because you have long, long resumes. Um, uh, Sarah Margon is the Washington Director at Human Rights Watch. Uh, prior uh, to joining Human Rights Watch, she was the Associate Director of Sustainable Security and Peacebuilding at the Center for American Progress. Uh, where she's done all kinds of incredible research uh, uh, on a bunch of issues, including civilian protection. The Honorable Matar, uh, Ebrahim Matar, and who is a former member of the Bahraini Parliament, who served as Bahraini young, Bahrain's youngest MP, representing its largest constituency, and again has a very, uh, very impressive uh, resume. Uh, Cole Bockenfeld is the Deputy Director for Policy at the uh, Project on Middle East uh, Democracy. And uh, he has studied uh, Middle East issues and global diplomacy at the University of Arkansas, Georgetown, and the University of London. And again, also a very distinguished resume. So, um, um, and I'm going to submit all of your resumes for the record so that uh, when people read this hearing record, they will know how distinguished all of you are. But uh, let me begin with uh, Mr. Dooley, who has been here on many occasions, and, um, and uh, we'll begin the testimony with you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thanks very much for convening this hearing. 
Uh, look, I say this not out of uh, any sense of protocol or for an obligation of good manners, but uh, I want to say your tenacity on the struggle for human rights in Bahrain it really is a fabulous example to other members here, to parliamentarians across the world, uh, to NGOs and activists everywhere. You have stuck with this for years, whether it's been in the headlines or not, fashionable or not, politically advantageous or not, not least with your support of leading human rights defender Nabil Rajab, who's currently in jail facing a series of trumped up charges. Uh, over 30 years ago, when I interned here for Senator Ted Kennedy, researching anti-apartheid legislation, South Africans struggling for democracy spoke about him the way that many Bahrainis speak about you today. Uh, that's not a comparison I make lightly, but they see you as a friend in Congress in difficult times, refusing to accept that it's in the US's best interest to be aligned with a reckless, repressive regime. And we thank you for your dedication to this issue. Uh, others here today are going to outline details of the worsening repression in Bahrain, and I'm going to talk about three issues. First, briefly, the issue of access for journalists and NGOs. Uh, secondly, the failure of Bahrain security forces to reflect the communities they serve. And third, the influence of Iran. Uh, let me just get out of costume if I see. Um, in 2011 and 12, uh, I visited Bahrain several times and wrote a series of reports uh, documenting human rights violations. Since March 2012, I've been refused entry to Bahrain despite many repeated attempts uh, to visit. I'm not alone in being de facto banned from the country. Most other NGOs and journalists find it impossible to gain access. You will recall, Mr. Chairman, that in August 2014, you and I were refused access to the country despite going through the proper channels to request visas. Human rights researchers can't get in and many activists now can't get out, with an alarming increase in travel bans against local human rights voices intending to speak at the UN Human Rights Council and other venues. Bahrain's airport has become a dangerous place for activists. Women's rights and anti-corruption activist Hadej Jamshir was arrested there last month and remains in jail. Human rights lawyer Mohammed al Taja, who spoke at an event with you and I here last year, Mr Chairman, is one of many now banned from leaving the country. The US government should look at imposing its own travel restrictions on Bahrainis linked to human rights abuses to consider not letting them into this country. The second issue of security sector reform is one we followed for some years. Sectarianism is clearly a major problem in Bahrain and in the region and a major driver of violence. Bahrain <coughs> is unique among Gulf countries in having a Shia majority uh, governed by a Sunni ruling family. A lopsidedly sectarian makeup of security forces is an obstacle to stability in Bahrain and undermines US national interests in the country and the region. The majority Shia population is barely represented in its security forces, contributing to wider grievances about a lack of job opportunities and fueling political unrest. While this is true both of the police and the military in Bahrain, I'll focus on the military because the State Department decided a year ago to lift the ban on weapons to Bahrain's defense force despite its involvement in human rights violations. The 2011 Bikki report, which you've referenced already, uh, found that the Bahrain Defence Forces uh, were responsible for 100 arrests, including of medics. One of those doctors arrested, paediatric orthopaedic surgeon Dolly Al uh, Dr Ali Alekri, was seized by military, by soldiers, from the hospital where he worked, taken to a military facility, beaten and forced to eat faeces. He remains in jail to this day, and no senior military official has been held to account for the torture or other human rights violations committed by the military. The Bikki report found that nine Shia mosques were reportedly demolished with the involvement of the BDF and recommended the Bahrain government, quote, establish urgently a program for the integration into the security forces of personnel from all the communities in Bahrain. Uh, this hasn't happened. The failure to integrate the security forces is a major problem, one long recognized by the US government. In successive annual country reports, in the latest reports by the US Commission on International Religious Freedom, in last week's report from the Congressional Research Service, the issue of sheer exclusion from the security forces has been highlighted. Former Defense Secretary Bob Gates says in his 2014 book that when he met the King of Bahrain in March 2011, he told him, time is not on your side. You need to move forward in integrating the Shia into the security service and the Bahrain Defence Force. 
It's hard to know just how few Shia are in the military because the BDF hasn't provided statistics, but we guess at most a, a few percent. The State Department's decision in June 2015 to lift restrictions on selling arms to the Bahrain military was a significant mistake, as we warned it would be. Uh, I'd like to join you, Mr. Chairman, in uh, regretting that nobody from the administration was available to attend today uh, and share their plan for what they intend to do for the rest of the year uh, when it comes to Bahrain's political crisis. Uh, the lifting of that ban has not resulted in reform, and in fact, since then, there has been a crackdown on dissent more severe than anything since 2011. As our friend Nabil Rajab said in the New York Times last week, recent American statements on Bahrain's human rights problems have been strong, and that's good, but unless the US is willing to use its leverage, fine words have little effect. We recommend the US link training and equipping of Bahrain's military forces to their progress on recruiting and promoting Shias. The US government provided expertise and technical help in the decade between 2001 and 2011 to the police service in the north of Ireland, helping to address the sectarian imbalance there up in the Catholic representation in that decade from around 8% to around 30%. The US <clears throat> government should insist that its continued cooperation with the BDF depends on a commitment to in integration, starting with producing the number of Shias and Sunnis currently in its ranks. Uh, lastly, let me turn briefly to the issue of uh, Iran uh, and its part in Bahrain's unrest. Uh, the 2011 Biki report said the Bahrain government couldn't produce evidence of Iranian involvement, and five years later on, it's hard to assess the degree of Iran's influence in Bahrain. Although the government has obtained confessions from people admitting to colluding with Iran, these confessions should be viewed with some skepticism, given the regime's record on interrogation methods. The attacks on security personnel, although some have been fatal, don't bear the hallmarks of an advanced strategy or sophisticated training by Iran's Revolutionary Guard. When in the mid-80s I was here researching anti-apartheid legislation, the concerns I heard about the influence of the Soviet Union on the anti-apartheid movement are similar to today's worries about the influence of Iran on dissidents in Bahrain. I was asked if Bishop Desmond Tutu was an unwitting Politburo puppet if the Kremlin secretly funded the democracy activists, whether Mandela was unduly influenced by communists. We're not naive. Does Iran enjoy Bahrain's difficulties? Of course. But that doesn't negate the legitimate grievances of the Bahraini opposition. Removing Iran from the equation doesn't solve Bahrain's problems of unrest and instability, and in fact presents the continuing repression presents Iran with thir a further opportunity to exploit real and imagined grievances. Uh, as Senator Rubio said when opposing previous arms transfers to Bahrain, he said, I believe the Bahrain government's response to the, to the disturbances actually threatens the country's long-term stability, jeopardizes the United States standing in Bahrain and the Middle East, and plays into the hands of Iran. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we've submitted fuller written testimony with a series of recommendations, but I'll just highlight a couple here. One is that the House supports uh, Bill HR 3445, the bipartisan bill introduced by yourself and Jim Pitts, to ban the sale of small arms to Bahrain until the government fully implements all 26 BICI recommendations. Uh, that the Departments of State, Defense and Justice should offer technical support and training in diversifying Bahrain security services and link further cooperation on progress to diversifying uh, the security sector and that the State Department should also consider visa bans on those it believes guilty of human rights violations and should publicly call for the international media and international human rights organizations to be afforded meaningful access to Bahrain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to your questions. Well, we, we go right down the list here. So the Honorable Matar, Abraham Matar, welcome. Just make sure your mic is on to this one. Yeah. Um, Thank you for having me here today, and I would like to thank you, uh, Congressman uh, Jim Mc McKevin, for your role in Bahrain and for uh, the role of the entire team at the Tom Lantus Committee about uh, the situation in Bahrain. Also, I, I would like to thank uh, Secretary John Kerry for visiting Bahrain and uh, meeting with all sides 
and I'd like to, to thank uh, the DRL team and the ambassador, Samantha Power, for raising the issue of, of Bahrain continuously. Um, also, I would like to thank the State Department for taking the initiative and releasing the statements to address the revocation of the citizenship of Sheikh Isa Qasim and refusing the accusation of the Bahraini government to link him, to link him with the Iranian policy. Um, of course, these statements are important, but they are not enough to address the situation in Bahrain. And the uh, U.S. government need to uh, look at this uh, issue in Bahrain seriously because even U.S. interest is affected by uh, the deterioration in Bahrain. Um, I, I, want, I want also to highlight the role of Sheikh Isa Qasim and Nabil Rajab specifically. Uh, I do believe that they play extraordinary role to protect Bahrain from uh, uh, moving toward sectarianism and violence. And this role should be uh, recognized by the administration as well. Uh, in my testimony today, also I want to emphasize on the vision of the pro-democracy movement about how to move forward and how uh, to move toward an inclusive government and fair political system. In Bahrain, uh, the conservative Islamic Shia party, Al-Wifaq, and the liberal uh, mixed party of Sunnah and Shia, Wa'ad, they are both working together uh, under the same vision toward a constitutional monarchy. A wide part of the pro-democracy movement accept the ruling family to be in power, but they refuse the authoritarianism. Uh, Wad and Al-Wafaq were looking forward to extend, extend the relation with the GCC country, including Saudi Arabia. And this strategy will remain despite the cold and negative response from Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, I believe that the pro-democracy movement in Bahrain is still uh, able to convince a wide majority of Bahrainis uh, to accept a gradual reform process. Uh, if the right confidence building measure were taken a place by all sides, I may elaborate more about these required measures during the Q&A. Uh, the sectarianism in Bahrain is a major feature for the, the, the recent phase of deterioration in Bahrain. And sectarianism is a very tricky term. Um, we need to be very careful when we address it. The struggle in Bahrain is not about a sectarianism between Sunnah and Shia. It's about a sectarian policies that are coming from the Bahraini government about the Shia popula population. It's also important to mention that sectarian, sectarianism and sectarian policy against the Shia doesn't mean that the government of Bahrain is a conservative government that cares about the Sunni, Sunni uh, Muslims or the Sunni Islam. Uh, the Bahraini government is not conservative at all and it's all about politics. The Sunni in Bahrain are losing as well. The Bahraini government are encouraging the Sunni to join from early ages security forces and Bahrain defense forces and the National Guards and to be hired in the public sector in general. It's very hard for them to speak out against the Bahraini government and it's very hard for them to quit from their job and to join the labor market. They are stuck under these circumstances, and um, it's it's very hard uh, for them to speak out about about their grievances. Um, finally, when the government of Bahrain commits sectarian policies against the Shia, this doesn't mean that the government will tolerate opposition uh, figures from the Sunnis. Uh, in Bahrain, the government may sometimes be much harsher on Sunnis than Shia if they speak out. The case of uh, Ibrahim Sharif, uh, the moderate liberal Sunni, is a very clear case. The government arrested him twice and sentenced him since the beginning of the uprising. And the first uh, detainee uh, during the Bahrain uprising was Muhammad al-Buflasa, who was Sunni as well and he was tortured severely for his role. Uh, recently, Mohammed al-Buflasa decided to live in the country and live in exile. 
Um, the question here is where does U.S. fit in all this? In fact, stability in Bahrain uh, is very important for U.S. and it helps U.S. Fifth Fleet to operate in Bahrain. Currently, stability in Bahrain is built on repression and sectarian policies against the Shia, or I can say uh, a, a, a persecution policy against the Shia by the Bahraini government. The stability also is built on blackmailing against the Sunni people, and it is based on human trafficking that is facing the Southeast Asians who are used in the front line for, uh, of the conflict to face the frustrated uh, protesters. It is not a good approach for US administration to enjoy a stability that caused Bahrain all this damage. Bahrain, uh, uh, before thinking about how US administration can promote democracy in Bahrain, we should think about how the government of Bahrain can be prevented from using the special relation with U.S. against the Bahraini people. The, the Congress here will be on the right track uh, when its member supports uh, the 2009 and the HR 344 bill, which prohibit uh, a specific arms sales Unit, uh, to be sold to Bahrain until Bahrain government fully implement the BICI uh, recommendation. Uh, I don't prefer to see my country sanctioned. On the other hand, uh, I don't want to see Bahrain government enhancing their legitimacy of their policy by more international recognition through uh, US arms sales. Um, it is for US interests and Saudi interests, and it's for the interests of the Bahraini people to have a success story of a transition in Bahrain. Uh, U.S. cannot prevent the deterioration in Bahrain alone. Uh, it's important for U.K. and E.U. to show a leadership in this as well. The U.S. administration uh, uh, avoided to lead a political process in Bahrain. The US administration had good understanding and they have a good analysis about the situation in Bahrain. And they have a lot of interest in Bahrain. It's the time to turn uh, into a proactive policies through leadership and persistence. And thank you. Thank you. Ms. McGraw. Thank you. Chairman and Governor, for inviting me to testify on Bahrain. It's a, it's a very timely hearing. I'd like to echo the comments of my co-panelists as well uh, on your commitment and perseverance in, in picking up on the Bahrain issue, even when it's not um, sexy or um, seemingly moving in the right direction. So thank you for that. This hearing comes at the end of a week when Bahrain's most notable human rights defender, Nabil Rajab, who also is on our advisory board, had an op-ed in the New York Times only to be charged the next day with deliberate dissemination of false news and spreading tendacious rumors that undermine the prestige of the state, as you said. In response, the New York Times was not happy, and they ran a stinging editorial which notes that relying on rulers who have responded to dissent with torture, tear gas, jail cells, and travel bans is not a defensible long-term strategy. They're right. Once again, Bahrain is in the news, and it's not for good reason. It may look from afar that government, the government's crackdown has kept political unrest in Bahrain at bay. Street protests have dwindled significantly, and the November 2014 parliamentary election did see strong voter turnout. However, if you scratch the surface even just a little bit, you'll see that the demonstrations have decreased predominantly because so many activists are incarcerated or exiled. And the election had high participation mainly from the Sunni community, which in turn endorsed a majority of the ruling family's supporters. The Shia-dominated main opposition, Awafak, boycotted because of extreme gerrymandering and the government's hostility to meaningful reform. The cleavage reflects a deepening societal polarization to the point where the main opposition felt that participation in the election was an exercise in futility that would actually further their political disenfranchisement and badly undermine their own standing with supporters. 
So in, since 2011, successive efforts to resolve the political impasse in Bahrain have been undermined by hardliners in government who see the unrest exclusively as a security, or problem, security problem that requires repressive and a sectarian response. The jailing of people like Najil, Nabil Rajab and Wafak leader Ali Salma, Salman, combined with the intimidation of other dissenting voices, leaves frustrated youth with few political outlets other than violence. It also has the potential to confirm a political dynamic that the hardliners, who now dominate the government, appear to be fomenting with repressive tactics. Ultimately, this is only going to backfire more and more, since the absence of space for peaceful dissent is likely to ripen the possibility for radicalization and overall instability. On a trip to Bahrain earlier this year, Secretary Kerry asserted that Bahrain remains a critical security partner and an important member of the US-led coalition to fight ISIS. And while he did meet with Nabil Rajab and other critics of the government while he was there, since that visit, we've actually seen a marked deterioration in the human rights situation. High-profile activists are imprisoned on trumped-up charges, creating a climate of fear for lower-level activists. The government has also started going after Shia clerics in a systematic campaign of harassment and subjected key civil society leaders and independent journalists to arbitrary travel bans. Statements calling for the release of Rajab and other opposition activists are important, but their impact is limited because of the mutual security interests that tend to drive the U.S.-Bahrain partnership. An immediate shift in the partnership may not be imminent, but these does, it does seem dangerously narrow and perhaps even wholly inconsistent with the wider U.S. interests laid out by the president himself who noted in 2015 that when people are oppressed and human rights are denied, particularly along sectarian lines or ethnic lines, when dissent is silenced, it feeds violent extremism. I won't get into the details um, of some of the activists who have been detained or exiled, but I will say that one by one, the Bahrain government is picking off its political opposition and rights activists. The trumped up charges and the flawed trials that have led to their imprisonment appears to be part of a larger strategy to silent governmental opponents and keep others from speaking out. What I did want to focus on a bit was what's happening with the Shia clerics. With the moderate opposition and activists now behind bars, the authorities in Bahrain have started going after these clerics in a very deliberate and methodical way. On August 18th, for example, a Bahraini court convicted Sheikh Ali Humadin of illegal gathering and sentenced him to one year in prison for being part of a peaceful gathering outside the home of the spiritual le leader who was recently and arbitrarily stripped of his citizenship, as you mentioned before. Media reports indicate that at least eight others are facing similar charges, and credible local sources told us that since June of this year, the government has questioned or brought charges against at least 56 Shia clerics. We also spoke to four Shia clerics who told us that they were charged with illegal gathering. Another three that said they had been questioned about it. The interrogation and prosecution is an attempt to intimidate and intensify the dis discrimination against the Shia community in Bahrain. Inevitably, these tactics feed sectarian polarization in a manner that could lead to greater political violence down the road without that opening or space for political dissent amongst the wider population, which is missing right now. I'd like to move to recommendations, and I'm happy to answer more details during the Q&A. But nearly five years after King Hamad accepted the findings and recs of the Biki report, hope for real change in Bahrain is basically absent. That said, I do think bold gestures by the government could still generate a reset, and the best way to do this would be to release Bahrain's imprisoned opposition leaders and activists, give the nonviolent opposition and the Shia clerics the space to protest peacefully, and then over time resume an actual dialogue. So the question is, how can that happen, and what can the U.S. do to help move us in that direction? Public statements, as my co-panelists mentioned, are important, and they should continue. The U.S. actually really does maintain a high degree of influence with the authorities in Manama, despite what they seem to tell us repeatedly. This is largely because of the security relationship and the presence of the U.S. Navy's Fifth Fleet. And over the past years, if you look at the administrations, they've gotten stronger and stronger, bolder and bolder, as their oppression has intensified. This is a welcome development, not only for us as Human Rights Watch, but because it lets the opposition and the activists know that there's a renewed urgency within U.S. policy. They also let the Bahraini rulers know that if they are testing the alliance and looking to see how much the U.S. will tolerate, 
they're going to hit a ceiling at some point, regardless of current geopolitical dynamics. One venue that the administration could use to amplify its concerns is the UN Human Rights Council, which begins its three-week session next week in Geneva. The US could and should play a leading role in generating a joint statement from like-minded governments that call out the Bahrainis regarding the critical state of human rights there. It's important to note that as the situation deteriorates in Bahrain, the statements ultimately will only go so far if they're not backed up by concrete measures. This means ensuring security assistance to Bahrain is not used for or to assist with repression or abuse and is not used by security forces that have those records. It means in this house supporting HR 3445, that's an important step for Congress to take and the, the uh, uh, parallel bill in the Senate. But it also means exploring alternative options for basing the Fifth Fleet and support to the aircraft now flying out of Isla Air Base. This last step is not only important to up the ante and pressing the Bahrainis to resume political reform, but it, but it demonstrates just how concerned the US is by their oppression, particularly against the Shia minor majority. Finally, a global sanctioning regime like the global Magnitsky bill would authorize would be incredibly helpful. As you know well, denying visas and access to the US and its banking system to members of the security forces and judicial system credibly linked to serious crimes can make waves. As Brian said, many of us are not allowed to enter that country, and so in some sense it would be quid pro quo for what they're doing there. Ultimately, if the Bahraini government believes that Congress as a whole and the administration during its final months in office will indulge them regardless of the human rights situation, they are sure to be less responsive to U.S. concerns. Showing a willingness to reconsider the status quo may be the best way to encourage genuine reform and to ensure the U.S. Bahraini partnership doesn't go up in flames over the long term. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing. I want to echo uh, all of the, the praise for you personally for, for staying so dedicated and, and focused on Bahrain uh, even before 2011, before we've seen the major uprisings and sustaining that, that focus over the years. Today's discussion is, is particularly timely. Uh, as, as my colleagues have mentioned, the Bahraini government has dramatically escalated its crackdown on peaceful dissent over the past several months, the scale of which we have not seen since March 2011. Your sustained interest and attention to the human rights situation in Bahrain is admirable and welcome, especially in a region where so many crises compete for our attention. Unfortunately, your consistent focus has not been shared by the administration which has paid inconsistent attention to Bahrain's political crisis over the past five years. At key points, especially in spring 2011, senior administration officials were diligently behind the scenes to try to move a political process forward. And following the release of the BICI report in November 2011, the Obama administration emphasized the importance of the Bahraini government implementing these reforms to set the stage for resolving the country's political crisis but the Bahraini government ultimately rejected such an approach, opting instead for a path marked by repression and exclusion. Unsurprisingly, this approach is failing to bring stability to Bahrain and has instead predictably sustained and even worsened the political crisis in the country. Part of the focus of today's hearing is, is on the status of the government's progress in implementing the recommendations of the Bikki Report. As has been mentioned, uh, in June, the State Department submitted to Congress its assessment of that progress. The details of that report are quite damning and illustrate clearly the Bahraini government's refusal to carry out the important steps that it committed to five years ago. However, the importance and effectiveness of the State Department's assessment are undermined by an apparent effort to pull punches uh, by avoiding clear evaluations of progress in order to avoid antagonizing the Bahraini government. Our careful reading of that assessment is that the U.S. State Department considers only seven of the 26 BICI recommendations to have been fully implemented by the government. But the State Department's unwillingness to state this clearly or to acknowledge publicly the serious implications of this lack of progress for stability in Bahrain and for U.S. security interests in the Gulf is disgraceful and counterproductive. Further, the report does not fulfill the legislative requirements set by Congress. The law requires three things of that report. First, describe the steps taken by the Bahraini government to implement each recommendation. Second, identify further steps the government should take to fully implement each rec. And third, 
provide an assessment of the impact of the findings on U.S. security in the region. The report produced in June, 141 days after it was due to Congress, seems to fully address the first point, address the second only inconsistently and incompletely, and not meaningfully address the third at all. Frankly, the Bahraini government's recent boldness in escalating its crackdown is unsurprising, given the extremely weak and inconsistent reactions of the international community and especially of the U.S. administration to its lack of progress on reform and its worsening abuses of human rights. The administration has repeatedly lowered the bar over the past several years regarding the need for reform in Bahrain. For example, President Obama was right to declare publicly in 2011 that, quote, the only way forward is for the government and opposition to engage in a dialogue, and you can't have a real dialogue when parts of the peaceful opposition are in jail. Yet, when the Bahraini government moved forward with half-hearted and cosmetic attempts at national dialogue, but without releasing any of these key figures to participate, the State Department failed to acknowledge, as President Obama had done in 2011, that no real dialogue was possible, instead pushing other opposition leaders to participate, and later, incredibly, even joining the government of Bahrain and blaming the opposition boycott for the continued political crisis. This administration has repeatedly backed down on its demands, looked the other way, and changed the subject when Bahrain's rulers have openly rebuffed them. It's not surprising, then, that the Bahraini government ignores calls for reform from the U.S. government today. Fortunately, the U.S. government has no shortage of policy tools at its disposal to try and persuade the monarchy to change course. As we now witness the worst crackdown in Bahrain since 2011, the administration must move beyond merely debating potential policy responses. It's time for decisive action. In that regard, I recommend the following. Along with my colleagues, I believe the administration should immediately reinstate a suspension of arms sales to the Bahraini military and keep that suspension in place at least until the, the Bahraini government has implemented all of the BICI recommendations. Concerned members should also co-sponsor H.R. 3445, uh, which would tie those sales uh, to full implementation. Doing so will help bring pressure on the administration to reimpose the arms sale ban that it wrongly lifted more than a year ago. Uh, second, the administration should deny visas and freeze assets of Bahraini officials and security forces who have been credibly linked as the BICI report documented thoroughly to gross human rights violations. The administration could apply these restrictions proactively under current law, but has not yet been willing to do so for Bahraini officials. If this does not change, Congress should force the administration's hand by passing the Global Magnitsky Bill. Third, Congress should include in the final FY17 Appropriations Act the Senate language on Bahrain which would require the State Department to produce an updated BICI assessment. Uh, members of Congress should impress upon administration officials the need for that report to, one, clearly label each recommendation as fully, partially, or not implemented, so we have a baseline to measure progress. Two, outline what remains to be done. And three, analyze the impact of those findings on U.S. security in the region, which it completely failed to do this year. And fourth and finally, Congress should also press the Defense Department to publicly release its report on an assessment of the security situation in Bahrain, including contingency plans for the U.S. Fifth Fleet. That report is an opportunity for the administration to correct its error of omission in the State Department's assessment, which failed to describe the impact on security interests in the region. As President Obama said in April 2015, the biggest threats the Gulf governments face may not be coming from Iran invading. It's going to be from dissatisfaction inside their own countries. The DOD report should adequately account for that, for the security threat the Bahraini government is actively stoking by ignoring peaceful demands for change from its people. Thank you again. I look forward to your questions. Well, let me thank all of you for your excellent uh, and concise testimony. Um, and before I get into any questions, I want to recognize my colleague, Representative Randy Heldgren, uh, who's a member of the Executive Committee of the uh, Human Rights Commission for any comments he may have. Thank you, Chairman. I also want to thank you for the work that you all do. Uh, this is uh, really important and uh, seems like so many challenging issues around the world in regards to human rights, but uh, just really grateful for uh, your help and your focus and your suggestions. I think uh, very good, clear suggestions that uh, 
we have to recognize that we do have uh, leverage uh, and we need to use it. We need to um, recognize when abuses are happening and when there's this sense that um, some places feel like there's no consequences and they can kind of do what they want to do. Uh, so I'm grateful for the work that you're doing. We do want to, in a bipartisan way, find out again how we can uh, speak up and, and stand up uh, for the rights of those who are being uh, persecuted and abused uh, around the world, but especially in Bahrain. Appreciate uh, what you're doing there. And Chairman, I know they just called votes. So we just have a few minutes left. So I'm going to yield back the balance of my time. Uh, in, um, uh, let you ask questions. Yeah, thanks. thank you. And um, and so um, we have a few minutes here, but then we'll, um, I'll take a break and I'll come back if, if, if you can stay. But it, uh, so um, you know, um, I don't want to dwell on this, but as I said in the beginning, it kind of bugs me that the administration didn't send a witness here. But uh, I'm kind of over it. Um, <laughs> but but not really. Uh, so I, I, I want to ask the first question I was going to ask of them, and maybe you can respond because this is one of the things that kind of sticks in my craw. Uh, you know, State Department assessments of Bahrain's implementation of the recommendations of the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry have tended to credit the government with more extensive implementation than have outside objective ass assessments. And the question was, what accounts for the apparent discrepancy? Uh, why, why do you do that? Um, and since they're not here to answer, um, maybe you might have some insight uh, as to why uh, there was this discrepancy. Let me just say this. I understand this is uncomfortable. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, we have military and strategic interests in Bahrain. Um, they're an ally, um, and, you know, and the world is very, very complicated. Uh, but that, to me, does not ex excuse the fact that I think when it comes to pressing them on human rights, um, we have not been as forceful as I think uh, we should be. Um, and as a result, I think we haven't seen the kind of progress uh, that we all want. But anyway, I just maybe you, you could be the administration and tell me why there is this discrepancy. Yeah, Mr. Dooley. Thanks. I, I, I'd love the chance to uh, speak yeah. on behalf of the administration. I, I <laughs> think that's unlikely to happen uh, <laughs> anytime soon. Uh, but but uh, let me take one example. I was at the launch. I was in, invited by the Bahrain government to go uh, for the launch of the Bikki report in November uh, 2011. And when the re recommendations came out, 26 of them, some of them looked very difficult to and long-term to implement, and they are. I mean, secure, uh, uh, reforming the security services, for instance, is not something you can do overnight, or changing the culture of the media is not something you, you can do overnight. Uh, but my, uh, my I fell on uh, 1722G, because that's something which could have been done overnight, which was in an anti-torture uh, measure, that all uh, interviews with detained persons should be recorded audiovisually. And this, for me, has become, just that small clause has become really fairly emblematic of what's gone on here. Um, they could have set up within days um, recording of people who have been interrogated. Instead, what happened was the Bahraini government uh, took, I think, 18 months to install very high-tech security uh, cameras uh, within some police stations. And now it claims that this um, recommendation has been fulfilled because it's got cameras in some stations. And even more gallingly, uh, the US just reports that as though, well, that sounds like they've gone at least partially the way to uh, fulfilling that recommendation. Um, but if you're not going to turn those cameras on, and if you're not going to allow the evidence of filming of interrogations to be presented in court, which doesn't happen, then that recommendation hasn't been filled. You're supposed to be recording all uh, interviews with detained persons. And saying, well, we've put cameras in the ceiling isn't the same thing at all. That's like saying you've run the New York Marathon because you've bought a new pair of sneakers. Mm -hmm. It's not the same thing. And for the administration to not question that and push on that and ask, why, if these things are being filmed, aren't they allowed to be presented as evidence in court, which they're not, uh, is perplexing to me. So I can understand that, that the administration doesn't want to cause unnecessary waves. Uh, there are sensitivities around the relationship. But really, on things like this, this is an easy call right. for them to make. Uh, I was actually going to bring up another example. Yeah, sure. I think what we've seen is that there have been some cosmetic or partial measures that look pretty good from the outside when it comes to implementing the, some of the recommendations, some of the easier ones, as Brian points out. But actually, to get them to work, some of the logistical pieces, those haven't been 
backed up. And so what the administration has taken at face value actually doesn't have roots. Another example is the creation of an ombudsman. So the Bahrainis did create an ombudsman. And if I'm not mistaken, it has one, maybe two staff, but it's not very well funded. And they're not able to produce the type of reports or recommendations. Furthermore, many are nervous to go to the ombudsman um, with claims uh, of torture or something else in the criminal justice system because they are afraid that, in fact, it isn't sufficiently as independent as it should be. If it doesn't have its own budget line and isn't able to do open public reporting, it doesn't quite have the strength that an ombudsman is supposed to have. I would just also note that we put a report out about six or seven months ago on torture in, in the prisons on the heels of the Bicky report, and we actually found that it had continued to go on and in some cases escalated. So. Brian's right, a lot of the recommendations are long-term and do take multiple steps to implement, but for so many of them, the first step was superficial at best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. I just add to that, I mean, uh, my organization, ProMed, put out one of those independent assessments uh, a year after, and we found that they had implemented three of the recommendations. Uh, the State Department first put their assessment out in 2013, gave them five, uh, now in, in 2016, uh, we count up to seven. The most generous number I have seen comes from the, the chair of the commission, Sharif Basayuni, uh, who said a couple months ago that they've implemented 10. Uh, I don't want to get into the, the sort of details and nitpicking because I think two things are clear here. Uh, five years after the king publicly uh, pledged to implement these recommendations urgently, we're not even halfway. We're not even halfway across the finish line. And the situation in Bahrain has gotten significantly worse. I also want to put the BICI in context. You know, at the time it was introduced, this was intended to be the bare minimum, sort of to move the country out of the crisis that it saw in, in, in February and March, to introduce some accountability, transparency, to get things going in. But that alone, even if they had implemented all 26, wouldn't have been able to pull the country out of crisis. But it was going to be the bridge to that bigger political compromise that needed to happen in the long term. So I think it's no surprise that five years after, not even halfway uh, done, that we see the country uh, sort of in the crisis that it is today. No, and, I, and I, again, I, um, I mean, <laughs> it's making believe that you are the administration right now, um, you know, I would follow up with simply saying that when you exaggerate um, progress on some of these issues, uh, especially involving human rights, um, you, uh, you give people an out. Uh, and it makes us look like human rights is not that important. It makes us look like we're a cheap date when it comes to human rights. And I, th I think part of the problem here is that the lack of implementation uh, has not been followed with any kind of consequence that's real. Um, and so, you know, for those who are pursuing some of these policies in Bahrain, I mean, what, where is the incentive? Well, you know, why, why feel, where's the pressure to really uh, to change things? And, um, and so I think we're at the point where we need to go beyond statements and, um, you know, and again, so we'll, we'll, we'll explore some of the recommendations you have when we get back, but uh, they just call votes. So we have, how many votes? Yes. We have two votes. So I, I'll, it, won't, it shouldn't take that long, but uh, uh, I have some questions if you guys can remain um, and I'll be back as soon as possible, but thank you. And then when we come back, you'll be who you really are. You won't be the administration anymore. All right, thanks. <laughs>
All right, I apologize for that, but uh, that's the end of them, end of the votes. Um, anyway, um, thank you again for your, for your testimony. Let me, let me ask, um, and whoever wants to answer this, or all of you, or one of you, or whoever, uh, but uh, how, do you, how do you understand or explain the sudden recent uh, escalation of, uh, of repression? I mean, what, what has changed or provoked this escalation, uh, in your opinion? Yeah, let me elaborate on this. I um, uh, I think that the Bahraini government is trying to go with the escalation as far as they as I, as they can. They always look at the constraints and they go with the repression until they reach these constraints. When they found that U.S. administration is taking a passive passive position toward the uh, deterioration Bahrain. They found it an opportunity to go in, in, in more escalation uh, and more repression. So um, a clear position from US administration play a major role to prevent a, a, a more deterioration of the situation in Bahrain. I'm just going to say quickly, I think the 2014 parliamentary elections combined with some shifting in, in, the, in the governing of the ruling family kind of gave them a ticket. You know, if you have over 50 percent participation from the Sunni community, you can say, well, we basically have a mandate right. to, to do what we need to do. So that's part of the internal dynamics, I think, that sort of gave them the sense of opportunity to continue this repressive trajectory. But then I think the growth and strengthening of the anti-ISIS coalition and the critical role that they have played according to administration officials also made them feel indispensable. Right. And so in a sense, there were no consequences and they could depend on the mandate that they had been given, at least the parliament had been given. And so the combination um, allow them to go uh, forward a little bit more fully and um, publicly than they had been in years prior when they were, you know, looking like they were taking reform steps. But in fact, what we know is that it was mostly cosmetic. It's not to say that there aren't people within the ruling family that do want to see change and reform. It's just that in this internal battle in the Al Khalifa family, they've lost out for the time being. I'll also just add, I, I think it's pretty clear that the Bahraini government's really emboldened uh, to sort of push back against U.S. pressure. I mean, I, th I think it's an important moment that uh, Secretary Kerry visited Bahrain in April, uh, clearly was trying to find a, a restart uh, to get things to move forward, uh, sort of looking forward to the 2018 parliamentary elections. What can we do to get reform back on track uh, to get the opposition to participate next time? I think that was a key moment that was uh, only just a month or so later uh, pretty clearly rebuffed with this uh, sort of series of backward steps. Uh, also, I think it was an important moment, uh, and I'll credit the administration, uh, that the Vice President Biden called the king, uh, expressing real concern and asking uh, for a reversal of some of these steps. The last time uh, uh, publicly mentioned that, that, that Biden spoke to the king about these these kinds of issues was several years ago when Khalil Marzouk, one of the key opposition leaders, was in prison uh, pushing for his release. Uh, and Al Marzouk was released at that time. And so I think now it's, it's particularly alarming that some of these you know, very senior officials asking for things directly from the Bahraini government, uh, steps that used to have some impact uh, on, on the Bahraini government, aren't having that same impact anymore. So I think we've got to take further steps. Yeah, I think all of that's right. I think um, that Washington probably isn't the center of uh, the universe for these calculations for the Bahraini ruling family. I think it's an important part of it. Uh, but while I think that the lack of consequences from the US administration um, enables this, I don't think is the, the main driver of it. Uh, but I would say that um, if they're not gonna take any notice of Secretary Kerry or Vice President uh, Biden, it's time for the president to speak. Mm -hmm. Uh, he spoke pretty clearly uh, and straightforwardly in uh, May of 2011 when he said publicly that uh, the attacks on the Shia mosques ought to stop, and they did uh, within days. And so, again, um, it's regrettable nobody from the administration is here to, to share some thoughts on this, but, but why shouldn't the president uh, speak public, publicly about this now? No, and I agree with you. And I, let me just say, too, uh, 
so I don't come off as too harsh in the administration. I mean, uh, there are people in the administration. I, I give the the Vice President credit, Secretary Kerry, uh, Tom Milanowski has uh, you know played an important role in these uh, some of these uh, some of some of these issues. Um, so there are people I know that have genuine concern over this. Um, it's just that I, I don't think that they've translated in the type of, into the type of consequence that has resulted in the kind of change that we were all hoping for. So, um, you know, there needs to be, I think, more, more follow through. Let me ask you this. I mean, 25 percent of Bahrain's population is young uh, and, and potentially vulnerable to disillusionment. Um, are, there, are there actions that the United States government could be taking uh, to reach out to, to the youth um, to, uh, to help? maybe empower their voices uh, more? Um, uh, there is a, a, a wide frustration among the new generation about U.S. foreign policy and the region and Bahrain specifically. Uh, there is the feeling that um, the current relation uh, 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 secure U.S. interest in Bahrain but doesn't care about the interest of, the, of Bahrainis. And whenever Bahrain is addressed, uh, it's about the Bahraini regime, not the Bahraini people. So whenever US government consider Bahrain as strategic ally and uh, a closer friend, it's the, the regime who is uh, doing all the repression uh, against them. It's not uh, uh, the Bahraini people. I think extending the relation with the youth, uh, increasing all all the programs that are directed to the youth, the exchange programs, uh, all these programs can help to 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 encourage um, different perspective uh, about about us in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think. You know, what we're seeing is a, a younger generation is increasingly angry, but also increasingly segregated. Um, we're looking, you know, the way things are moving now, it's a two, t it's almost a two tiered situation, two tiered context um, in which the Shia community and especially the youth are being pushed into a corner. And inevitably, that means you are going to be frustrated and take a more polarizing position. Right. Um, and so, you know, the president himself has done a pretty amazing job of engaging young leaders in Asia and in Africa. And, you know, uh, given the tumult in the Middle East, I don't think it's the moment to create a young leaders um, community. But there are there is something to be said, given the percentage of young people in Bahrain and, uh, you know, making these efforts to do cross Sunni Shia programming. The other thing I would say is that some of the mosques and the media in Bahrain have perpetuated this polarization. And so countering that uh, with other forms of media, supporting other forms of media that could send a different message would be very important. Yeah. Well. I'd also add, as, as Sarah mentioned, that the sort of the opposition and the human rights community have been picked off one by one uh, over over the past several years, and, and and what you get in that kind of scenario is is a a large group of frustrated uh, youth uh, who have no leadership to look to, and those leadership uh, the leaders that they did look to who preach nonviolence and and patience and persistence uh, in that path. Uh, are now in jail. And so there's a real danger that the conclusion is, well, those methods don't right. work. Uh, so I think one of the most important things would be to strongly push for the release of those those kind of individuals to get back uh, out and, and among the public to try and, and communicate and, and channel those very real frustrations into some positive uh, sort of progress. Yeah, Brian. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think there's something pretty direct that the U.S. can do, um, referring back to my uh, prepared remarks, that, you know, if you're a, a young man or woman uh, in Bahrain, a Shia, and you want to join the security services or you're open to join the security services, those doors are just closed to you. And uh, it's something where I think the U.S. does have the influence to say, for instance, that last year under the IMET program, uh, exactly 100 Bahraini uh, military people came here, apparently. Uh, why not next year's 800 grand put in the, the budget for next year? Why not say, okay, we'll take another 100 next year, but, you know, six or eight of ten of those have to be young Shias. Uh, I don't see why those things can't be linked like that. Really, it's not going to change the, the political context overnight, 
uh, but it's going to institute the, the principle there that we're not going to keep underwriting this virtually um, exclusively Sunni sectarian force. Uh, it's something small, but I think it would, it would make a difference. Yeah. And l let me take this opportunity too to mention Naji Fatil, um, one of the human rights defenders, given a long prison sentence. He was um, uh, head of one of the Bahrain uh, youth human rights movements. Again, you know, for, for somebody young, particularly from the Shia community, who want to participate in civil society, uh, those doors are also pretty shut because civil society, as we know, is, is pretty much banned. So you, you all talked about, mentioned this, uh, many, I think almost all of you did in your testimony, uh, but um, in one form or the other, but I, I, I just want to get it on the record uh, clearly because when, uh, you know, uh, Bahraini officials visit us or, you know, their um, consultants or lobbyists or whatever you want to call them come and visit us, um, you know, they always, they invoke Iran, it's Iran, it's Iran, it's Iran. Um, and so how do you respond to the concern that uh, the opposition of Bahrain is influenced by Iran um, and, you know, uh, and what evidence uh, do you see one way or, or the other on that? I mean, how do, uh, how, how do, we, how do we answer that clearly? Uh, f first of all, I would like to encourage uh, U.S. administration and even the Congress to look to look at Bahrain uh, beyond the Iranian angle. Uh, okay, Iranian Iran is a, a major uh, threat and a challenge for U.S. and the region. Uh, but uh, looking about everything uh, in the region and link it with Iran, this will not help. Um, uh, U.S. and Bahrain, there is an opportunity for, for reform, and there is an opportunity for really to have a successful uh, story in Bahrain. And U.S. should invest in the strength of, of Bahrain instead of just looking uh, to the situation from the Iranian angle and uh, how to prevent the Iranian role in Bahrain. Um, returning back to your question, the Bahrainis, where Muslims, even before Mecca, which is the holy state in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, and they are Shia before the Iranians by 700 years. Uh, they have their own uh, leaders and they have their own school of thoughts, which is different than the Iranian school of thoughts uh, when it comes to Shiism. Um, Bahrains are Arab, a wide, a wide majority of Bahrainis are Arab, and they decided uh, to vote uh, for the uh, UN referendum to, to be an independent state and long, not linked with Iran. The situation is the same in Bahrain. Uh, uh, the pro-democracy movement, which have a very strong popularity in Bahrain, uh, they support a strong relation with the West, and they would like to have a good relation with all GCC countries, despite all <coughs> the <coughs> sorry all the negative uh, policies that are coming from the GCC. They would like to have a strong policy with them. They want to link their currency and their policy with the currency or with the dollar. They want to link it. With, with, with the economy of the GCC. Bahrain is, 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 is part of the Arabian Peninsula at the end. And what will happen in, in, the, in Saudi Arabia and the GCC, it will have the impact on Bahrain as well. So uh, we are part of the Arabian Peninsula at the end. This is how we think. Mm -hmm. And this is how we build our policies. I, I think it's it's very difficult to know. Frankly, I'm not sure anybody really knows the degree of influence um, of Iran or not on what's happening in Bahrain. But I think probably the question is, how do you stop it? I mean, whether it's whether it's large or small. Um, I think the likelihood is, the logic is that it's going to uh, be increasing. You know, the the more that you suffocate peaceful dissent, the more likely people are to uh, become violent, and therefore, they more likely they are to to look for help from uh, someone like Iran. Uh, but I think the question is, how do you prevent that happening? And you know, the the, the chess grandmasters say, make the move that your opponent least wants you to make. And and what does Tehran want? 
right? It wants this repression. It wants the people to be pushed into violent protest. It, it, if you take away that card of the grievances, if you, uh, if you allow to people to participate in civil society or get jobs in the government or join the security forces or have an inclusive politics, that's the last thing Tehran wants. So if you want to really push Iran out of the equation, uh, you should let in the sunlight of democracy a little bit. And I, I you know, this is really frustrating 30 years on. I hear the same thing over and over again. You know, yeah, but you can't be sure of these activists in Bahrain uh, because some of them have ties to Iran. Well, okay, there were communists in the civil rights movement here. There were communists in the end, quite openly in the anti-apartheid movement. It didn't mean that those things were illegitimate. It didn't negate uh, the demands that they were making. And in fact, the more that you pressure and stigmatize and alienate uh, a, a, a basically just uh, cause, the more likely you are to corrupt it and, and to drive it into the arms of Iran. This, Brian's right, this question does sort of keep coming up and coming up, and, and it's true that it's very it's hard, very hard to know. And I mean, Human Rights Watch hasn't done specific research into that, into the role of Iran in Bahrain, but what is important to note is that many Shia clerics did go to Iran to Qam for training over the years. My understanding is they also went to Najaf, but during the sanctions time with under Hussein, it was harder to get there, so they went to Iran. But that doesn't necessarily lead to the kind of connections that you may be asking about. Um, and based on the state of Bahrain's judiciary, the unfair trials, and the coerced confessions, it's very hard to know what really is there in terms of those connections. It's an easy out. And it's an easy thing to blame when you don't want to, 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 and it's an easy thing to look for when you don't want to deal with the actual problems that you have in your own country that the authorities themselves are encouraging. And I, I do think Brian's right in saying that the best way to keep Iran and their meddling tendencies out for the Bahrainis would be to open up space. But what seems like the, the, the strategy now seems to be exactly the opposite. So in a sense, they are potentially going to re realize their own worst fears uh, at some point down the road. Well, if, if you look at this question across the region of, of where Iran has the most influence, there's, there's a pretty clear pattern. You know, it's in countries where you either A, have sort of excluded and marginalized parts of the population, uh, sort of groups that are locked out of participating in society and government, or be in failed states. Uh, and we see this in Syria and Iraq. And so I think the key here is you, you want to avoid Bahrain becoming one of those, because that, of course, creates the opportunity for the Iranian influence and interference uh, to grow. I also think Bahrain presents a very good opportunity for the US and, and for the region. Unfortunately, there's sort of a narrative emerging across the region that, uh, you know, in, in this sort of sectarian uh, Sunni versus Shia, uh, battle that is going on across the region that the U.S. is consistently siding with the Sunnis, right? Whether it's in Syria, whether it's in Iraq, and, and, and so on. And, and I think in Bahrain, you have a real opportunity uh, to sort of quash that, you know, to say this is a country that has a long history of Sunni and Shia sort of living together, uh, working in government together. The, of course, the Shia parties have more than a decade of experience participating in parliament. This isn't a great unknown. And so with some big progress there, with some breakthrough there, you can sort of break that regional narrative that will have a, a sort of bigger impact. I just wanted to add one thing. I think one of the things that's been so frustrating about US policy to Bahrain is that Bahrain, truth be told, is far ahead in terms of political reform than so many of the other countries in the Gulf region. And I mean, if you look at where they sit, right, they, they are, the potential for them to move in the right direction, upholding basic fundamental rule of law and encouraging a pluralistic government, they're much closer than a lot of their neighbors. And yet what we see is this backsliding that moves them more in, that in the direction of the other Gulf countries. And so I think, for, I, I would guess, not to put my administration hat on again, as you said, but you know, I do think there's a lot of frustration in sort of being at that point where you see this willingness to reform and then it moves back. You see an interest in reform. In the early 2000s, you know, Bahrain became a, a major non-NATO ally and that was based on a commitment to reform and the 
the leverage there, the engagement was, let's start beginning a security relationship of strength. And so when you see them backing away in major significant ways from that kind of reform and creating a pluralistic society that Cole was talking about, the question that I keep saying is, well, how is the U.S. going to respond if they are increasingly not moving in the direction that the U.S. would like to see them in? Right. How do they take that tangible commitment over you know, many, many years and shift it for the good? No, and I appreciate, and I ask the question because it, it is, that is the response. Uh, it's always Iran, 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 Iran. And, and I think um, even with, even by some in our own administration, that's the, you know, that's what they bring out. It's, we, we have to, we have to be worried about the spread of Iranian influence um, in the country. But, you know, but my kind of response to that is that, you know, look, um, you know, we, we need to, we need to have a consistent standard on human rights. If we, if we say we are for the rule of law for everybody, then that, then we then then we need to live up to that. So if if Sunnis are not being treated right, we we're a voice for Sunnis. If Shia are not being treated right, we're a voice for Shias. But the the, the consistency here is that we all believe that uh, the rule of law should apply to everybody uh, equally. Um, and uh, and I think that uh, it's, it's been a frustration of mine as we've talked about this because even when you get people to concede about the increased repression uh, in Bahrain, usually somebody comes back and says, yeah, but, you know, yeah, but we, we, get, we have to worry about Iran. And, um, but I think you all have kind of made it very clear as well that uh, if you're really worried about Iran, then we ought to make sure that the rule of law is upheld for everybody because quite frankly, what you're just doing is you're fueling the anger and the frustration and the resentment, um, and you got to get to a point where people are so frustrated, where we can't talk about political reform, where people got to give up that there's any hope of negotiating with a government uh, that doesn't uh, that hasn't shown any interest in um, in, in in moving forward. Um, let me ask you, you know, we all we all talked about some of the you know steps that we might take. Um, talk about the global Magnitsky Bill as the author of the Magnitsky Bill in the House and co-author of the Global Magnitsky Bill, um, you know, I, I, I'm all for that, but just like when we passed the Magnitsky Bill, I reminded the administration that everything in the Magnitsky Bill, you already had the power to do. Um, and you don't need Congress uh, to, uh, to statutorily put into law that you have the right to do. You could do that right now. And so what might, what might be a helpful next step, um, given the fact that we're running out of time uh, in this uh, administration, is maybe we can think of a, a list of people um, who we all agree are, you know, fit into these categories, you know, and, and uh, you know, kind of go directly to the administration and say, you know, here are the three, here are the four, here are the five people that, quite frankly, have uh, been most consistently out front uh, in repressing uh, people in Bahrain, and uh, and you need to send 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 a signal. Um, and I'm a big I'm a believer in reciprocity. I mean, they they don't let you guys in. Um, yeah, they don't let me in either. You know, I mean, hurt my feelings. Um, but uh, but the reality is is that um, you know, if you're going to be able to pick and choose who you let in uh, to visit Bahrain, well then you know why can't we? Um, and what the difference is going to be is we're going to do it based on people who, um, by any objective measure, uh, you know, uh, are guilty of human rights violations. Yeah. Uh, that's a great idea, and uh, I think we'll have a list probably um, a bit longer than five. Uh, but, yeah, the, 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 the power already exists there, Presidential Proclamation 7750, uh, 8697, uh, these could be invoked to prevent uh, Bahraini officials coming here, have been credibly linked to human rights abuses or credibly linked in the case of 7750 to, to corruption. And so maybe we can work with you, know, with you guys collectively on that uh, and, and, uh, and move forward on that. But I guess then my question is, you know, how would the steps to, uh, to ban, you know, uh, to restrict travel um, by uh, certain people um, who are guilty of human rights violations or, you know, uh, you know how, or even the ban on armed transfers. Uh, how does that? Uh, do we believe that that actually contributes to the effort to encourage reform? Um, I mean, is, do you think that that's the kind of pressure that will move us in a in a, in a better direction, or does it have the uh, 
the opposite effect. So I'm just, I just ask you to respond to that. Yeah, I, I think it, it will have the, the uh, positive impact. Um, and at least if it will not have the po positive impact, U.S. will not be uh, part of the powers that uh, strengthen the Bahraini regime uh, and provide them with more uh, recognition while they are uh, responsible about all these repressive policies. I mean, punitive options, I think, are nobody's first choice right. for incentivizing reform. Um, conditioning military aid, sanctioning individuals. It, these are choices that have to be made when public condemnatory statements seem to fail. And you know, I think this administration really has moved in the right direction in terms of the strength and boldness of the statements. I find it surprising that there seems to be some reticence to support a joint statement or even lead a joint statement at the upcoming UN Human Rights uh, Council session in Geneva because it seems like the appropriate venue for a statement like that, particularly because they often like to work with like-minded states. So that would give them that opportunity. But even if they did that, it doesn't have to preclude the other concrete actions that you're talking about. When you talk about military aid, you know, there, it's, there is the BDF and then there is the MOI. And I think looking at the direct impact on abuse and repression is very important. The correlation on a day-to-day -day is very important in the near term. But in the longer term, if you look at the U.S.-Bahraini security relationship, that is what drives the partnership. And so, you know, you mentioned earlier the State Department individuals who have been concerned, Kerry's trip. Where is the Pentagon? And how can you move? Cole talked about the DOD report. But if you talk about the key uh, components of the U.S. partnership with the Bahrainis, the Pentagon plays an important role. And so it's not just about conditioning military aid. It's looking at that larger strategic relationship. Because frankly, if Bahrain goes up in flames, if things become violent, the Fifth Fleet isn't going to be able to stay there. And the thousands of Americans that are there for regional security uh, reasons are going to have to find somewhere else to go anyway. So it seems to me it's also in the Pentagon's interest to think bigger and pretend and possibly more publicly as well, even if that's not always their style, to look at the larger dynamics that they often say are outside their lane. I just want to pick up on this this point on the Fifth Fleet. I think, you know, when, when we and others talk about that the U.S. needs to sort of publicly say that they're exploring other options for relocating, uh, that isn't because we want the Fifth Fleet to leave. I don't think the Bahrainis want that. I don't think you want that. Uh, but it's, you know, frankly out of a real concern about the trajectory in the country and that someday we may not have a choice if the fleet can stay. And so signaling some concern and, and thinking about that uh, could helpfully move things in the right direction. Uh, on, the, on the question of visa bans, I, I think it could have a real impact. Um, you know, as we mentioned, one of the sort of key BICI recommendations was on accountability uh, for systematic, widespread torture, deaths and detention, and so on. Uh, the, the report itself found that, you know, this kind of thing could not have happened without the knowledge of the upper echelons of the Bahraini security forces. Since then, we have seen no senior officials held accountable. And so I think it'll be a positive signal uh, both to the Bahraini people, uh, but also a strong one to, to the government, uh, that if you are unwilling to hold these people accountable, uh, this small step of, of denying them access to the United States uh, will send that signal that, that at least we do hold them accountable in some ways. You know, another issue, I, I think the U.S. government spends a lot of time or, or, or concern thinking about uh, or worrying about uh, sort of strengthening the moderate voices within the opposition, uh, worrying about the sort of fringe radical voices growing and so on. Um, I think we have the same problem within the government. Uh, and frankly, you know, by denying visas to those that have been involved or ordered torture, you isolate those people. I think it's very important to the Bahraini government uh, that they have a strong relationship with the U.S. That's something that is extremely important to them over a long time. And so if they start seeing that these certain individuals uh, are losing that relationship, uh, then it may uh, sort of empower those uh, that, that want to move in a different direction. Uh, the final bit on the arms sales, you know, uh, for a long time I think there was a debate over whether that had any influence. Um, 
as you probably know, uh, as uh, more than more than us, every time Bahraini government officials came to Washington, or folks from their embassy or their lobbyists, this was one of the talk, uh, top talking points. When are you going to release the arms sales? We've done everything we need to do. You're targeting the wrong people, so on, so on. These things matter. These things have an impact, and I think it's a bit of strong leverage it's, that's underused. I do think it undermines that leverage uh, when the U.S. sort of backs off, lifts those in pieces, uh, or as we saw last year, uh, almost lifted them entirely in the absence of reform. If we reinstate that arms sales ban, the U.S. Has, has got to hold the line until we see the kind of progress we need. So I, I have one more question before I get to that last question. I just want to be clear. I think we're all in agreement here that we are we have kind of moved beyond the point where statements are sufficient. Um, that we need to be looking at additional action, whether it's visa bans or some of the other things that were recommended. We're at the point where kind of what we've been doing just hasn't hasn't been sufficient. Am I am, am I correct on everybody agrees with that? Yeah. yeah. I, I wanted just to echo something sure. Brian said earlier, which is that Washington is not the capital of Bahrain. Right. <laughs> and it's important to remember that, but the consistency and the strength of Washington's engagement with the authorities in Bahrain is what's so important. And you're right, moving beyond just the public statements when you've hit another point, when you see the level of repression is important. Usually we see arms bans, arm ban, uh, excuse me, arms bans, um, in response to violence, in response to blood on the streets, but because of the number of people incarcerated or in exile, you're seeing less protests. If they weren't in prison or in other countries, I think you may well see a lot more violence. Yeah. And, and the counter that some of the administration give to me about some of, the, uh, some of our concern about the uh, arms uh, that, are, that are being given is that they, they make a differentiation between those arms and the arms that are actually used on the streets to repress individuals who protest. So they, you know, they make those distinctions um, and say, so it's, even if we ban them, they could still do these, you know, they could still be repressive. Brian? Uh, yeah, and, and they, and they, and, and, the, and they say you can turn them off, that's directly derives from the authority. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I hear that and, and I don't like it when I hear it. Yeah. Um, it's true. Uh, that the uh, sales um, restrictions were lifted only to the military. Right. Uh, uh, but the idea that the military has somehow clean hands on this is just not true. Uh, the military has not brought any senior official to account for the abuses committed by the military in 2011, some of which I listed in my testimony, which included the torture of the medic, uh, Dolly, Dr. Ali Alekri, still in prison. Uh, uh, they're part in the arbitrary arrests. Uh, their parts in uh, demolishing the, the Shia mosques. So the idea that the, the police are the bad guys and, and the military right. aren't uh, just, just isn't true. Um, let me very quickly talk about the, the statements. Um, the statements clearly aren't enough from the administration, although I think it's fair to say that they have been better than they have been for a long time. Um, it would be great if the president said something, but certainly Ambassador Power, Assistant Secretary uh, Tom Malinowski, really are saying more or less the right things. Uh, it's great too, I think we should note that the administration now is prepared to speak up on behalf of and even meet Nabil Rajab. For several years, uh, I and others were urging that there be engagement between the US government uh, and Nabil and the US government for years refused to do that. Uh, so I think there's been some progress there, um, albeit very small. Um. So let, let me let me ask just one final question. Then you you guys can take some time and uh, uh, say whatever you want to say that I haven't asked or that uh, you didn't get a chance to talk about. But uh, um, you know, I we we do constantly get I mean almost on a daily basis reports um, from human rights advocates and political opposition leaders and students and activists. Um, you know, uh, constantly. Uh, reminding us of how repressive things have gotten, and um, lots of people have been have been imprisoned, um, have been tortured, uh, and uh, basically just exercising their fundamental rights. Um, and I agree with you. Look at uh, the, the the future of Bahrain really rests with the people of Bahrain. It's not not for Washington or any other capital to say this is 
you know, this is, this is who should be elected here and this is who should do this. Um, but I do think that, um, that we, can't, we do have an interest, uh, you know, all over the world on whether or not fundamental human rights are being respected and whether the rule of law is being applied uh, equally to everybody. Um, uh, and, uh, and we need to be a voice when people are being persecuted. I mean, I think, I think, those, I think that those are important things. Um, but w what more uh, can we do here to support those leaders and those activists who have been imprisoned for basically exercising their fundamental uh, basic rights? Um, uh, you know, we have, uh, we do speeches on the House floor, we do statements, we, you know, we, we've introduced resolutions, we've, um, I'm trying to figure out what else we can do um, as we're working on all these other things to help make sure that these people know that uh, they're not forgotten um, and to, again, send a strong signal to the government of Bahrain that people are watching uh, and, um, and people are very, very concerned. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, these statements are very important. And even, by, by the way, the statements are coming from the administration. Yes, they are when it comes to the State Department statement, they are uh, inefficient, but um, they are very important, and you just need to build on them. Uh, when it comes to the statements and the briefing and uh, uh, the letters are coming from the Congress, they are very important uh, to be continued. And uh, it's important to expand this work and to, to find more congressmen uh, who will support such kind of, of, of effort. Having more people to sign on these letters and to, to, to send letters to the Bahraini embassy and to the king directly, this will help and this will have an impact. Increasing the, 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 uh, the communication with the, Bahrain, with, with the U.S. administration about, about Bahrain. Uh, so uh, the, this effort is on the right track. It needs to be expanded and more communication need to be done with the administration about their policy in Bahrain. And it's important to think about uh, the bigger picture. Maybe looking at incident here and there is important to, 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 uh, to focus and to put the light on them. But what's more important is to, uh, to push for policies that help the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, Having U.S. leadership uh, uh, by sponsoring a political process in Bahrain is something very essential. And encouraging U.S. administration to take this leadership if the Europeans are reluctant, um, U.S. need to have uh, this leadership because they have more interest in Bahrain than the European. Uh, they have the fifth fleet there. They are gaining more than the others if there is really a successful a process in Bahrain. That's why the Congress should always encourage the administration to take the leadership. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is possible to succeed. Maybe it's, it's very hard for U.S. to change its policy towards Saudi Arabia. It's very hard for U.S. policy to change its policies in, in Middle East. But having a small change in a policy toward a small problem in Bahrain, I think this is feasible. And it, it can uh, uh, have, um, it can lead to a tangible outcome. And thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, uh, two things, just to add, I think everything that my uh, Co-panelists has said it are very legitimate. I would just uh, echo the call for expanding congressional interest in Bahrain, particularly in a bipartisan manner, particularly with a new Congress uh, coming down the pike. I think it sometimes numbers are not as important as the quality when it comes to letters, it comes to resolutions. And sometimes a growing number of members on in both the House and the Senate really signals congressional interest, really signals congressional concern in a different way. You certainly know this better than I do. Um, and so I think building a Bahraini constituency here in Congress on both sides of the aisle 
would be hugely, hugely valuable. Getting more members to try to travel to Bahrain, including ones that haven't been there before, would be very val valuable so they could see for their eyes, through their own eyes, what's going on. Um, the only other thing I would mention is that while the U.S. By the way, uh, many, many, tra many stop there, uh, right. and, uh, you know, already, um, and we've been trying to work with offices to make sure they have questions to ask, and that when they go there, it's just not just a layover right. on en route to you know another country in the region, but uh, that they ask to meet with uh, not only government officials but some of the opposition leaders, because I think that's the other part of this too, is that we do have a lot of members of Congress. That do stop there, and they, you know, um, and oftentimes they, their itinerary in Bahrain is maybe a cultural event and you know a greeting, and then that's it. Right. Um, so, uh, but I think that's a point well taken. But I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, but, no, that's great. That's the, yeah. I think that's 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 really great news, um, and we're happy to help with that as well. The other thing I would say is, while you, the U.S. does play a leadership role and perhaps have a little bit more of a vested interest than some of the EU colleagues, certain EU or maybe soon to not be EU members could play a more helpful role. And so in any meetings you do with other like-minded governments on you know, any number of issues, bringing up Bahrain with them is always important. I think it's helpful for those embassies here to go back to their capitals in London and Paris and, and you know, Berlin and say, we keep hearing from these members of Congress that we're not doing enough on Bahrain and we need to move in the right direction. So it's, it's a little less direct, but I think it starts to right. generate more right. impact. Brian? Uh, thanks. I, I, I think these congressional visits um, uh, offer much potential to members of Congress who go to Bahrain. I know, you know you've had difficulty getting access. Um, but one of the cultural events that they could uh, go to while they're there is to go and look at one of these kangaroo courts. Uh, go and look at a court in session. I've done it myself. Uh, and you see pretty clearly from the off that this is not a fair process where the defence they're not allowed to really bring evidence where the, um, the sentence, the verdict, have already been decided in advance and to call them out on it. One of the frustrations we've heard for several years now from political prisoners is that the US Embassy sends representatives uh, to their trials for the, the higher profile trials um, and never, say, never says afterwards that was an unfair process, that judicial proceeding there did not meet international standards. Um, if the embassy is reluctant to do that, and I don't think they should be, uh, maybe it's something that members of Congress could do. Um, I think that inviting people here, even if you know the likelihood is that they are going to be prevented from travel, uh, still matters. Uh, Nabil, for instance, Nabil Rajab is obviously still in prison. The other you know, leaders of the human rights movement, uh, by and large, are either in prison, Abdel Hadi Al Khawaja, Najib Fatil, the others, or they've been forced out into to exile. Um, but for those who are there in the country and not in jail, I think it's important that uh, they get official invitations here just to test and just to force the Bahrainis to, uh, to say, no, you can't come. Cool. And as, a, as I mentioned in the beginning, what we're seeing in Bahrain now is, is sort of the worst crackdown that we've seen since, since 2011. And even more dangerously uh, now compared to then is that we don't have anything on the horizon. Right? We don't have any national dialogue to look forward to or BICI report coming down uh, or the next set of parliamentary elections. Uh, and that's a very dangerous scenario because, it, frankly, there's, there's not a lot of opportunities for hope or for uh, sort of landmarks and future to aim for. I mean, Secretary Kerry did try to outline that to an extent, uh, pointing to the 2018 parliamentary elections. But unless some of these steps that have been taken this summer, you know, dissolving a Wafak, uh, jailing uh, Nabil Rajab, uh, Ali Salman, and so on. Unless those steps are reversed, that won't be possible. Uh, so I think, you know, in addition to the recommendations I mentioned in my testimony, I also uh, second uh, Brian's recommendation that, you know, frankly, at, at this point, it's time for the president to speak out. Uh, that at, at sort of the most senior levels of government, we've seen uh, Vice President Biden, Secretary Kerry weigh in. Uh, we have not heard from, from the president significantly on Bahrain in, in several years. I think it's important for him to reiterate uh, what he rightly said in 2011, that you have to have uh, these sort of peaceful opposition leaders out of jail for these things to move forward. Uh, I'd, I'd agree with my colleagues that the U.S. has a big role in leading the international community. Of course, they're not the only player on the scene, uh, but a lot of countries often defer to the United States uh, because they are sort of one of the most significant uh, allies of Bahrain. I'd, also, I'd say in particular, 
uh, the, the UK has really not been in a, a good spot, uh, has, has been even more harmful than, than U.S. policy, and that should be a real focus. Of and it's not unique to Bahrain, by the way, no. right. uh, unfortunately. Yeah. And then the, the last uh, sort of opportunity on, on the horizon every year, usually toward the end of the year, uh, the Manama Dialogue is in a uh, sort of high profile, very senior event of U.S. Gulf Bahraini officials, uh, including a lot of defense officials together every year. That's an important forum for them. That's an important uh, sort of opportunity for them to, to sort of showcase their image as a strong ally, as a strong defense partner. You've got a lot of the U.S. defense officials who could deliver these kinds of reform-oriented messages. That should be a real target uh, to look forward to and to think how can we influence uh, some of the thinking uh, at, at that discussion later this year. Yeah. Uh, I, I, this is an opportunity. Anyone has any last words that you want to offer, or, or have we exhausted everybody? Um, You're joking. We could talk about this. Absolutely. For days. No. I, 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 wanna, uh, I mean, this has been a, this has been an to me has been a very informative hearing, and I, pre I appreciate everybody's knowledge and expertise and thoughtfulness, and I think there's some really good suggestions here, but I want to make sure that, you know, that we're getting everything on the record here that, uh, that should be on the record, and so I'll give you this last opportunity. Well, thank you very much, and really, again, thanks for uh, uh, convening this here, and I know these things aren't easy to put together. Um, I, you know, I don't want us to be here again next year or in five years at the 10th anniversary of Picky, and now they're up to, you know, 11 recommendations. I mean, we can't keep having this sort of conversation. Um, I would like to see uh, the administration um, take some steps before it leaves office. It seems to have checked out uh, on Bahrain apart from making uh, the welcome statements. Um, so be it if we need to reset again uh, at the start of the next Congress. But really, there needs to be more, uh, I think Sarah mentioned it, more of a, um, an engagement with the Pentagon in, in this conversation. You know, they obviously have much at stake here, and it seems uh, to us that they're playing their cards pretty badly uh, in the long term. Um, that they seem to be enabling and supporting uh, actions which will not turn out well for them in the end. So um, much as I don't want to keep coming to the hearings and, and saying the same things about the repression, I think we need to keep having the conversations, but, but probably taking a different direction. We're really trying to, in, to engage DOD as well as state. And thanks very much again. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to emphasize about uh, that any failure for U.S. administration <clears throat> to take the right policies in Bahrain to support uh, more liberalization and more democratization, this failure uh, will have, uh, w the impact will propagate uh, about the uh, U.S. foreign policy and the uh, credibility of U.S. Uh, foreign policy in the entire region. Having the right policy in a small country like Bahrain does matter and does have an impact. <clears throat> we, we spoke a lot about the arms sales and about the role of uh, the Bahraini Defense Forces. Uh, oh, I want to mention the name of uh, Aziz Ayad, who was killed under torture. He was tortured, tortured till death during 2011. Uh, by uh, in the cells for Bahrain uh, defense forces, uh, uh, those who killed him did not bring for uh, to justice, and me myself, um, I was in a pr uh, in, in a military prison uh, during 2011. We were ill treated, and uh, the government deny uh, looking to our cases and our complaints. Um, I want to raise the, again the case of Mohammed al Buflasa, who was tortured in, in military facilities, and he was tortured severely. Uh, and as I said, he is a, a Sunni. He, he, he is the first detainee uh, during the uprising, and uh, the government will not discriminate uh, against anybody when it comes to criticizing their policies and calling for, for, for rights. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this hearing and for a really substantive discussion. I think the question is how do we here in Washington, all of us, government, non-governmental, -govern encourage a re-engagement and re-energizing of momentum for political reform in Bahrain? It's not an easy question. It takes uh, some hard strategic rethinking about where to push and pull pieces for movement, but it also requires a 
a, a parallel track of engaging not just the very, very high profile activists like Nabil Rajab, but it also encourage, it, it also requires engaging the lower level activists, the younger activists who are living in a climate of fear right now and as we've talked about, could be pushed in the wrong direction. That requires multiple prongs of the US government to engage in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. It requires an a US embassy in Manama that is open to thinking differently to engagement, to getting an ambassador out there as a representative regularly to meet with these individuals. And then it requires engagement back here in Washington from government officials who can push on some of the key prongs. I will just say that Congress has really been a leader in this, and you have played a very large role in pushing the administration to do the right thing, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's actually smart national security policy to do so. And we have high expectations that you will continue to do that. So thank you. Thank you. Cool. Mr. Chairman, thanks again for, for holding this hearing. I, I just want to add one sort of final thought. I mean, you mentioned some of the common responses you hear from, bah you know, on Bahrain, whether it's the Fifth Fleet, whether it's Iran, and so on. One of the responses that we encounter in a lot of our work across the region uh, outside of Bahrain is, is that, well, the U.S., we shouldn't be telling these countries what to do. Uh, we shouldn't be imposing our own solutions or, or a path forward. And here, I think, is, is Bahrain is very different and very interesting. Because if you look back at the BICI, this was something we had never seen before. You know, the, the sort of head of government openly sort of opening its records, opening itself to outside scrutiny to, to look at what happened and to chart out a path forward. After that report came out, the king himself pledged publicly to urgently implement those. I think that's a really key point, that these are Bahraini-owned uh, recommendations. These are not coming from the U.S. You know, we're not coming up with a laundry list of what they should do or what reform should look like. Uh, this came from within Bahrain. And so therefore, I think it's you know, a really strong point of leverage. Again, I don't want to overemphasize that it's sort of the cure-all uh, for Bahrain's problems, but it is the real launching point for the bigger solutions, and therefore I think it, you know we shouldn't get away from that, and, and should continue to hold uh, Bahrain's rulers and, and continue to hold the, the State Department and other senior officials uh, to continue pushing on on implementation. Well, thank you very much, and let me I, always, I I tend to say this a lot at the end of hearings on various issues in various countries, but uh, look, uh, you know. Uh, as a United States Congressman, I can say um, that the United States is not perfect on human rights. Um, and uh, those of us who care deeply about our country, we constantly challenge and we criticize and we try to pressure so that uh, we live up to the high standards that we all believe we should live up to. Uh, and when it comes to human rights all around the world, it's important not just to uh, highlight the, uh, the challenges that our adversaries may, uh, may face, but also our friends. And I always say, you know, when we criticize allies or friends, that you're not much of a friend um, if you don't call their attention to something that, quite frankly, is self-defeating. And I think we all agree that if the status quo continues, um, it, is, uh, it, it, it doesn't bode well for the future. And for those in Bahrain who are worried about kind of holding on to power or to their position, um, you know, uh, this kind of policy in the long run only undermines uh, their political future. So, you know, the stuff that we're talking about here today is not about trying to micromanage what happens in other, uh, in other governments. It is about just saying we, look, we believe, let's name this commission, it's the uh, Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. We believe that human rights is important, not just for people in the United States, not just for people in Bahrain, but people all over the world. And, um, and to the extent that we can be a little wind at the backs of those who are trying to, you know, to, you know, make that a reality, that's what that's what we're all about. So, um, one of the assignments that I am taking on right now is to follow up with all of you on this issue of visas. Um, that is something that we would like to be able to move on as quickly as possible while this administration is still in power. And we will also, uh, you know, uh, relay the message that uh, you know it would be helpful to the president. Uh, we're to be vocal uh, on this uh, before he leaves office. And then we're going to need to figure out a strategy to work with the next administration, whoever she may be, um, and uh, I hope. Um, but uh, I, I can say that because my, my colleagues no longer here. 
Um, but um, in any event, uh, thank you very much for taking the, your time and for a very informative hearing. This hearing comes to a close. Thank you.